in terms of network development, um, and then uh, move us into conversation and an activity which will sort of engage us and recognize that you know, with however many of us there are here, I think right now it says 21, um, you know, we are a learning network already. Uh, and so we are sort of a constituated you know, group of individuals who've come together with a shared purpose. Uh, and I want to see sort of in a live way uh, in a very short time that we have to see what we can do with that. Um, so you know, first I'll do a bit of explanation uh, and then we'll move into some of that if that sounds okay. Great. So where I work um, at Schumacher College, I've been here for about four years. Uh, I moved across from working at a small college called Sterling College in Northern Vermont in the United States. Um, so here we have about 120 students and we engage with masters and undergraduate a certificate and informal study students across disciplines that are basically at the intersection of uh, ecology, arts, community, uh, social justice, uh, and really sort of what we describe as head, heart, and hands learning. Uh, so, you know, not only are students in classes, um, you know, in a sort of an immersive residential format, uh, but they're also engaged in you know, participating in growing the food that we eat and preparing the food in the kitchens, cleaning up afterwards with community work groups working with residential volunteers. Um, and it's a very intergenerational cohort as well. We have students you know, as young as 18 all the way through to 82 uh, on some of our courses. And so it really is very much a focus on community learning. And as part of that work, you know, we have about 17,000 alumni uh, all around the world, many of whom you know, leave the college and are, are inspired by you know, what they've done in terms of immersive community learning to start up projects that are quite similar you know, wherever they might be. And there's some very active projects you know, in Peru and Colombia and Brazil and South Africa, um, all throughout Europe, Japan, China, Australia, and elsewhere. So, you know, we're capitalizing on that existing network, but also, you know, one of the challenges that I want to bring to this group and some of the work that I've been doing is how we take that immersive, engaged community learning model uh, and use it in a global context and engage people who might not be able to come uh, who might be, you know, for whether it's economic reasons or cultural reasons, social reasons, uh, or ecological ones, not be interested in traveling, you know, to England. And I, I don't believe everybody should come. Um, I think we should be able to meet people where they are, but also to engage them in a really embodied and engaged and experiential way. Um, so thus, one of the challenges for developing a, a for engaged learning network. So I'd like to switch on my slide share here um, and just get us started with that and just work through. And if you've got any um, questions during the course of the presentation, and let's see, I might want to swap displays there. Are you seeing the full screen display? Just double checking. We are. Pavel, do we just want to just pause for a sec because we have got our translator oh, great. here now. So, uh, we've created, um, if you look down the bottom with the language interpretation option. So if you would like to just stay listening to Pavel in English, then just select that one. Um, if you would like to listen to the Spanish interpretation, then just select that one, um, that channel and listen in from that one. Really excellent. Okay. Thank if you. there's any problems, just yeah, reach out in the chat. All right. Sorry, Pavel, back over to you. That's all right, thanks. Um, so really just as a title slide to explain where something about the sort of genesis or, or what the key issues are around distributed learning networks. Um, you know, for me, they're about regenerative relationships. Um, and you know, in that sharing across the network, you know, is that sense of aliveness. Uh, so really very much focusing on the engagement and the relationship across the different members of a network. And then you sort of coined this phrase, corridors of abundance. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the models for that in just a couple of slides. So I'm gonna just walk through a few. And, and the first two are really just about language. Um, you know, my background is in uh, environmental humanities and literary study and philosophy. Uh, so I'm often inspired by the words of others. So just to share some of those, and I'm happy to make, I don't know how possible that is Tiff, but to make these slides available if people are interested you know, during the course or after the event. So we can certainly work on that. Um, but just to share you know, one of, sort of the original um, sort of context for this is in the sixth century BC by a philosopher named uh, Anaximander, who just very briefly wrote, you know, all things originate from one another and vanish into one another according to necessity. 
Uh, they give to each other justice and recompense for injustice in conformity with the order of time. And I really like the first start of that. Basically, you know, people were beginning to ask in Greek culture, um, you know, specifically, where do things start and where do things end? Uh, and so for me, when I'm developing a network or thinking about relationships, it's where do things come from and where, where do they end? And it seems to be that many people have done work around this and focused on that idea of relationship. It's not so much about the nodes on the network as it is about the connective elements. And so just leaping forward a few centuries, you know, for 2017 and 2022, a couple of folks that, you know, I've uh, uh, sort of engaged in our teaching quite a bit. We actually had Thomas Nail in our class this past week. Um, you know, come to the same real uh, sort of conclusions or ideas about networks. You know, Matthew Tyson suggests actually in an essay about mountain bike riding down a hill, you know, that we're not individuals so much as we are at the concept, at the sort of intersection of forces, the intersection of more than human relationships, of relationship with community, with society, with economy and other things, that we exist only as the expression of those intersections. You know, our bodies are um, really expressions of those forces, which for me gives us an incredible power. Uh, it doesn't take away our sense of agency and ownership, but actually gives us empowerment. And then Thomas Nail suggests there that actually it's movement. If we, you know, that, that's it's quite a negative uh, paragraph there, but we cannot adequately understand, you know, contemporary politics, or I would say learning through the paradigm of static states and stationary citizens. Um, and he's very much about uh, movements begins everything and relationships are at the heart of everything. And if we refuse to understand that, you know, particularly these days around global mobility, uh, you know, climate migration, shifting borders, refugee crises, uh, you know, all of those things just speak to the, the um, struggle we have between static systems um, and the movement of humans and more than human individuals. So just to think about what learning models we have and what some of the challenges are for me, as the head of a college, and I've been in academic leadership probably for about 20 or 25 years now, um, you know, we are still faced with this challenge that we're teaching the same way we've taught for many, many decades. Educational models that are static, that are siloed, that are institutionalized, centralized, and exclusive. And so for me, the underlying question, you know, the core question of that is what could education look like if we understand, model, and engage with our world as a complex, integrated, socio-ecological system? So rather than just, oh, well, we're here as humans, as people, we're a social system, and then there's an ecological system over here. And you know, how do we, so traditionally, you would say, well, how do we engage with that not human, uh, that other uh, world? And so for me, if we combine the two and think about an integrated sociological ecological system, what does that enable us to see and to do? Uh, and then thus, we're left with these possibilities. You know, learning communities in a network model you know, and an experience-based one particularly can be participant-led, experience-based, generative, deinstitutionalized, so effectively fragmenting monolithic educational institutions, empowering to the individuals as everybody contributes, relational, so about relationships, accessible, uh, and really engage across the more than human, uh, as well as just the human world. So I realize there are a lot of words on these slides, um, so you do need to sort of pause, take a screenshot, translate um, if you need to do that. And then I'm going to just pause a little bit on this one. And the next one has more words on it, but again, we can make these available. One more back. There we go. So when I talk about the, the a distributed learning network model, and I pulled these off of a, uh, a chapter that I recently wrote for a book that's going to come out relatively soon on um, regenerative ecosystems. But the key elements of a distributed learning network model are equitable and accessible sort of site-based facilitation. Um, so as I talked about at the very beginning, we have a network of people who are doing wonderful things in place and you're engaged in you know, food and farming or with community engagement or teaching or um, social justice issues or climate justice. Um, then you are doing, you are the expert in your field wherever you are, and how might we be able to work across a network to help capitalize on that expertise um, and the ability to facilitate things on site um, across that network. And deployment of learning clusters. So to be able to engage students from around the world at these uh, different sites um, and giving the sites agency and ownership uh, and actually 
you know, generating a curriculum from across that distributed network um, you know, to increase sort of accessibility, authenticity, and local relevance. Uh, the development of new network identities and ecologies for interspe interspecies collabor collaboratory spaces. One of my favorite phrases that could mean all sorts of things, right? But effectively, it's thinking about us in the context of the more than human. Uh, so how do you include the more than human when you're developing these uh, learning networks? And that, that's absolutely key. And then the implementation, you know, because the networks will be are, are typically held in a format like this one, uh, which is not not experiential and not necessarily um, you know face to face. You know what tools are important, um, and there's a movement on next generation digital learning environments. Um, that doesn't mean some new high tech thing. Actually, it means uh, a minimal computing approach that act, that uses tools that are authentic to the people who bring them into the room. Um, so it's not saying, well, we're going to build this really flashy, uh, you know, online, you know, virtual learning environment, but actually what tools are people already using that we could capitalize uh, and using a, effectively a version of local knowledge um, in a digital sphere as well. Um, there we go. And just to give a, a quick or visual overview, if you're unfamiliar with the relationship of, you know, what a distributed network looks like. Uh, compared to a centralized or a decentralized model. Um, I find this visual quite helpful. I mean, centralized is kind of what it says on the tin. Um, there's a central, you know, whether it's an institution or a government or uh, a set of principles that is that are sort of centralized and organizing, um, and then everything else branches off from that central piece. A decentralized one takes that one step further and says, well, actually, there are sort of other central nodes um, that other that, that can cluster you know, individual nodes and expertise around. Whereas a fully distributed model, um, you know, every uh, point on the node, or point on the network, every node on the network, sorry, um, has its own agency uh, and has sort of equal weight. Uh, and there's equality and sort of equity of access and equity of contribution across that network. Um, you know, there's also a term called a federated network uh, which you know, if you're into for computer network development, you know, a lot of people use. And for me, I, I tend to use them synonymously, although there are some technical differences that we could talk about. Um, and what's important for me is that similarly to an ecosystem, a distributed network really has no center. Um, so if the center disappears, then there's a new center that, that comes into play. Um, well, I don't, won't spend too much time on this. This is just another version that I've used in the past to demonstrate what um, you know, a distributed learning network might look like or what pieces it brings together. Uh, and particularly around uh, the one I'm about to describe a bit, sort of community, connectivity, uh, equitability, collaboration. Uh, and then, you know, I, I use the term ecosemiotic there, but really thinking about uh, socio-ecological networks, uh, as I've described. So how you bring together sort of bioregional ideas um, into a learning network and how you engage the more than human community as well. So, and again, they're practice-led, they're place-rooted. And they have a hybrid dimension uh, because we're using online tools to bring people together. So I wanted to just give a quick overview of the, um, the learning network that we've developed in collaboration with the Conscious Food System Alliance, that UNDP project that I described at the very beginning. Um, and as we've been building this, we have about 20 or 25 active partners. And it's a really messy uh, uh, map of that network that was developed by one of our partners through the Graph Commons tool, which is a super cool tool for, for network design and development. But effectively, that gives you a sense of who uh, the core um, you know, participants are. Uh, and they are on six continents around the world, uh, many in the global south. Um, and they have all of the expertise that you have identified across the outer, you know, um, outer circles of this network map. And what this tool enables us to do um, is to look at the, well, one, look at the mission that we've got here on the left-hand side to facilitate uh, an equitable exchange of knowledge and experience across local centers. Uh, and in this particular model, offering conscious food learning programs and retreats that empower uh, partners to co-create and provide a program for a broad range of stakeholders. And that was a, a mission that we, our mission statement that we developed over the course of a year in collaboration you know, with these partners. And what we've been doing is developing a ground up curriculum um, that we've recently just had some funding to, um, to take this the next step uh, in, the, in the development process. But what this model allows us to do is, for example, Siendo Naturaleza in Peru, you know, outside of Tarapoto in the um, in 
and the edge of the rainforest, you know, we can see, all right, well, they're interested and they have expertise in these particular areas. So how can we map then their expertise you know, with those of others who might be you know, expert in agroecology, for instance, uh, and then use this tool to be able to uh, work with them to, to develop the curriculum so that, for example, the group in Peru might be able to deliver learning and experience in a particular subject uh, that then you know, these other groups, so Efecto Mariposa, which is in Colombia, or Sinal de Valle, which is in uh, Brazil, uh, or in the group in Belgium, or, or all over the place, how they might be able to access that um, that bit of learning, which is produced by the group um, in Peru, uh, and sort of translated across the network, um, you know, for, for for use and engagement in other sites. And key to this is the ability to facilitate um, on-site learning, you know, at any one of these different hubs. So each one of these is effectively a teaching center, as well. So one of the models that's been sort of inspirational to this, and I've mentioned a couple of times, our desire to integrate the more than human. Uh, into these conversations, you know, is you know the concept of um, corridor ecology uh, and really sort of capitalizing on relational flourishing. And so, if if you think about the um, sort of science and um, sort of engagement of ecological corridors corridors around the world, these are just a couple of examples. The left one is in Brazil, and the one on the right, I think, is in Scandinavia somewhere. I'm not, I apologize, I don't know exactly where, but effectively creating pathways for species of all kinds uh, to safely traverse from one protected area to another. Um, and you know, what happens, and here's a, a model that might help with that, um, is you know, similarly to developing a network, you know, we're creating a network for more than human species you know, to integrate and collaborate with the humans who also um, you know, inhabit these environments to move um, between protected areas. And what's interesting to me is that you know very often whatever version of the corridor you engage with, you know they are interspecies. Um, often they are multi generational. So in, if, if you think about some species, they don't just walk from one protected area to the next, but they inhabit the corridors. The so corridors themselves become that relational space, and they become the safe space in and of themselves. I think mean, that's really interesting. Um, that it may take several generations for some species to move from one protected area to the next. And these can be plant species as well as animal species um, in a slow migra migratory pattern. And eventually, um, hopefully, those gaps will fill in. I think that's the intent. They cut across national boundaries. Um, they engage with communities uh, as well as as well as with um, with natural, well, human communities as well as with more than human communities. Um, and then they're multisensory. You know, they're fully immersive multisensory networks. So I know that was quite a bit uh, to go through in probably about 20 or 25 minutes. Um, and so I just wanted to sketch out you know, what, what it is that a um, you know, distributed learning network is. Um, and you, know, might, you might be very familiar with this concept. This might be completely new to you. Uh, but I want to come back to the idea that we already are uh, a vibrant and diverse learning network here in this virtual room. Um, and so I think we've now got uh, 26 participants in the group. So I think, Tiff, we are going to go ahead with those breakout rooms. And, you know, the instructions here on the slide, which we can put in the chat, um, you know, so you can see them in the breakout rooms. We're going to see what we can do um, in our own spaces. And, um, you know, in, we've got probably about half an hour. So, so in that time, um, we're going to take 15 minutes to break out into individual rooms, um, probably about three or four people. And we're breaking them down th today uh, according to, you know, pick six of the senses. Um, so sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell, and then body awareness or a kinesthetic sense of how your body works in the world. Um, and they, we can certainly talk about other senses that might be able to be represented. Um, but how do we take, so, so coming back to the original question, you know, if we're engaged in, as we are today, in a virtual learning network, in a sort of a virtual space, how do we take the actual sensory information um, and experience that we can have wherever we are, um, and how can we bring that to the network to share uh, with the larger group? So the task is to find something in your space. So as we break you out into groups, um, let me take five minutes not in front of the screen. So get up, look around, whether you're in your room or in your house or your apartment, or you can step outside, uh, wherever you might be, 
Um, and we're going to assign you in a breakout room according to a particular sense. So you might be in a hearing breakout room, in which case your task is to find something in your space that connects with that sense and then bring that back to your small group. And within that small group, have a conversation and respond to that prompt in green. How can I share this sensory experience with the larger group? What are some ways I can translate what I'm hearing here in a way that will be as experiential as possible um, across this virtual network and share with everyone else? Excellent. Well, hopefully that was um, useful for you to be focused on a particular sense. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm going to shut up for a while. Um, and I would love to hear you know, if one person from each group wants to share what that process was like. Um, and then the last bit of what I asked you to do was see how you can share with the larger group um, that sensory experience that you had so that we might be able to have at least the smallest um, sort of engagement with that. So who'd like to go first? Raise your hand or just speak up. Uh, yes, uh, is it uh, Jana? Hi. So um, it was very interesting for me. It felt like all three of us in my group, which was sight, tuned into the same uh, spirit in terms of it being very much about mind sight and internal vision. So I would invite everyone to close your eyes. And let's start by being in the dark on a beautiful night where there's the sound of an owl and you can't see where it is. And you're using your eyes to look through the dark to try to see the owl that you can hear. And then maybe there's just a feeling of the presence of the owl as if you can see it with something other than your eyes. And following that, you could become a meditator in a cave behind a waterfall, feeling the dark around you of the cave that isn't dark because there's the light of the meditation in the cave, that inner light. And then into that, I invite you to see a color that is in between purple and green, a color of magic like the sight version of one hand clapping. That's all. Thank you so much. Wow. That's beautiful. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, could we have the sharing from all of the groups and then maybe we'll step back for just a minute. So thank you, sight. Someone, I saw another hand up before, but they went away. Uh, Roxanne. I was raising before, but I'm always not, I'm always not, almost not daring to go after such a beautiful share. <laughs> um, but we had, we had a different discussion. Um, we were the body group um, and we discussed so I'm, I mentioned in the group that I in the morning usually go swim in the ocean. We're living in Portugal right now. And that experience of um, immersing yourself in this massive, forceful, um, cold water bucket, uh, you know, like that water bucket, just this ocean, this um, vast space. Um, and that feeling I get in the morning when, you know, it numbs my body, but it also activates my body. And also I, I feel like I'm part of something and I feel that I'm one with the water. And I feel that there's, as you mentioned at the beginning, there's no end, there's no beginning. I'm just in this uh, massive uh, field of life. Um, and then a group member suggested that one way we could feel that because we discussed, okay, what's the complexity if I'm, I'm in that, how can I transmit this feeling, especially if you are not anywhere near a cold area or this big water body. And I actually wanted to ask maybe Jonas, you could do the exercise because you're the one who suggested this. And uh, I think it's it's an awesome idea. I think it's it was such a beautiful uh, sharing or idea. Um, do you wanna take it from here? Uh, 
Um, hmm. I'm not sure if I if I can do a, a guided breathing session, but I can I can try. Why not? So let's uh, um, let's just do uh, ten deep deep um, in and out without uh, break uh, in between, and then uh, let it all out and hold it for let's say fifteen seconds, and then breathe all in and uh, keep it in. So let's go. That would be it. Right. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, and I, I was reminded just quickly, Roxanne, when you were talking about the ocean, um, you know, during the pandemic, I was separated from my family for over a year and a half, um, but we're both on the North Atlantic. So we thought about and used the ocean as a way to connect because we could be in the same ocean, even if we were thousands of miles apart. So brilliant, thank you. Okay, other senses. Do we have someone from smell? Yes, um, I was I was quite a bit on my own, and then I got um, somebody a bargaba in the room, but he's at the dropping off the call. So um, I spent the first thing that I got it was an apple, so I just went and grabbed it and I started eating half of it because I was trying to infuse myself with the smell of it. Unfortunately. Fruits in Europe don't seem to have that much of a smell. So I went outside into the garden and at one point I did try my, my Hannah sub and some doing um, growing some herbs, but it's a bit all over the place. I don't really have a proper garden. Uh, but I got a bit of lemon balm that grows on its own basically. And I started, then he came in into the room. So I started to, he, he wanted to know what was happening, you know, what we had to do. And I started to, describe the smell of the different herbs that I have here. And it's like, uh, how do you convey smell through the, through the virtual world? It's, I think it's quite difficult. So it's kind of, I think uh, we were, to, I, was, I was telling him that I think it's, it's kind of the mind, the subconscious mind likes like images and symbols and very heightened words like, the smell is like incredibly lemony and it's like, it smells, it reminds me of a summer, summer's day, mm. uh, a day, a, a sunny summer's day. Um, the, I have fennel. The fennel reminds me of uh, licorice and it's quite a strong, sweet taste. And there's a drink in Spain that is kind of anise, which is like a licorice type of very strong, like, very strong, quite alcoholic. And uh, so he had, I'm gonna say a bit of his because he had uh, a, a small rose and I said like, does it smell? Because all the ones that you get in the supermarket here don't really smell. And he was saying that it smells like, he was in India, so it smells like the rain after, the, the, the smell of the earth after the rain. And I said, how does the, this, the earth smells after the rain in India? because it, I think it could be different to what I experienced here. He was saying it's like, yeah, fresh and coming and it brings out the happiness in you and the plants turning green. So we were had all the kind of that discussion about, I was asking him questions to try to bring out 
Hmm. Taste the experience of it. That's wonderful. And I, I think connecting those smells to, to other things and to memories um, and to experience. You know, smell is one of the most powerful senses to bring, at least for me, uh, to bring back memories of childhood or memories of experience. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. And other senses that we have. Touch. Anyone from the touch group? Taste. Okay. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, so I thought it was quite interesting, little synchronicity, because uh, I do love everything connected to taste food cooking and uh, Denise which was in my group also uh, has this connection and I'm not sure Lakshmi uh, if she has the same she, we were running out of time a bit so I was uh, describing uh, kefir 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 that I made myself and I started getting into it like a month ago and this one was ready at the 27th so the first day of the conference and loaded with positive emotions and the funny thing about kefir it never ever tastes the same exactly so there's always slight variations one time it's a bit thicker and other times it's a bit thinner and then it's more sour less sour and this one is really amazing it's really it has a lot of body but it's not heavy it's it's really fluffy it's just very slightly sour and it has this amazing smooth milky taste and yeah it's refreshing and mm. It has a lot of body, but it's not heavy. It's it's really fluffy and yeah. Also, just a slight sourness. It's not like sour. It's just this refreshing sourness, but there is also a hint of sweetness and a lot of creaminess. Yeah, and. I don't know, maybe Denise or Lakshmi want to share some of their experience as well. So, thank you. That, that was absolutely beautiful. I think you invested uh, Kiefer with every bodily sense uh, in your description. So really appreciate that, Nicholas. Um, and I couldn't think, I can't really think of a better food, um, you know, for a conversation about networks because it's, it is a collaboration already. Um, yeah. and, our, and by consuming it, we, we you know, integrate the more than human world within us um, and become part of that collaboration. So much appreciated. That's the amazing thing also for me, just to add, it's a life. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, you could say it's picking up energies. That's why people yeah. say also, if you make, say, kraut, sauerkraut or mm. fermenting foods, if you use the same recipe exactly, if two persons make it, it will never taste the same because there is also energies going into it. So, yeah, thanks. I did see Lakshmi unmute. And just to say, I think we've, we've got a few more minutes, um, but if, if you wanted to add a little something, Lakshmi? I just... Um... I just enjoyed uh, what Nicholas was uh, explaining the taste. I think it, uh, he used all the other senses as he was ex expressing the taste of taste. I mean, I think he also explored the sight. The, um, the other, uh, other um, senses were also equally uh, you know, explored along with the taste. I thought that was something. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, but Matoni said in the um, in the chat that you can speak on touch. Do you want to do that? Yes, yes. I, um, I think we are all we, we were all feeling shy about talking today as from the group, but we are. It was a it was a wonderful session. So now uh, we were the three of us. I'll 
click on how it unfolded for all of us. So for Niall, um, she narrated to us about how she closed her eyes and she felt the search on her fingers that allowed uh, her to go back to her pulse rate and her feelings. And I talked about how I petted my dog and I closed my eyes and I felt the texture, the fur and the length of the fur. And I think those two experiences were sort of connected because we were, we both agreed while we were discussing that we got little messages by just paying attention to what this experience of touch felt for, for us. And yeah, just the little messages that came with that, that a lot, that informed us of mm. the other things that we are experiencing. So it was, a, as Niall said, it was a small action with big information. Yeah, there was also one more group member who said something. We ran out of time, but she also was telling us about how her roof was fallen, and she's uh, she's on she's on a hammock, and she feels very supported by the hammock as much as she's feeling supported by this conference and the beautiful people of it. And I, I do not, I'm not able to draw a direct uh, relation to touch, but I thought that was very beautiful and it should mm -hmm. meet us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Matoni. Um, yeah, no, really lovely. And, and there's a, just a note, there's a wonderful book um, by Donna Haraway on when species meet. Um, and she spends the beginning of the book talking about petting a dog. Uh, so when you talked about that, you know, when we pet the dog, who are we actually touching? What are we touching? Um, and touch is such an entry point, as all of these senses are, to larger conversations and constellations of experiences and knowledges and sharings. So I think we have hearing still. Um, is there anybody want to speak for hearing? I think we're also a shy group, um, but I'll speak a little, a little bit about it. Um, yeah, we, we had a really beautiful time. Um, Susan uh, shared the, she brought us out to the backyard and we heard the bird songs um, where she lives, which is in the middle of the US, which was really lovely for me because I'm from the US, but I live in Estonia right now. And the bird songs like transported me back home because suddenly it was the birds that I had grown up with. Because it was, you know, we share a lot of similar birds, our states. Um, so it was kind of a powerful experience of how sound can can kind of, yeah, I can do that. I don't know how to name it. Um, and then I have my guitar. So I shared a song and or the beginning of a song. And then Vision Rainbow, who is Arifa also, also shared a beautiful song um, and described kind of through words, all the different sounds going on like around her in her space. So there's a lot of different types of, of sound sharing going on, but yeah, yeah, it was really lovely experience. Great, thank you so much, Grace. Um, and you know, birds are another one of those things that they have created this global network that we're just passing through. Um, and so they, they connect such disparate places in the world as well. So I know we're a little bit over on time and I just wanted to say what a you know, beautiful experience it has been working with all of you for an hour, um, just hearing you know, your stories, your experiences with the different senses. Um, and you know, hopefully you know, through those experiences, you can start to pull the threads from some of the for more for technical stuff we talked about early on um, and you know, begin to see, well, actually there is a way uh, that we've created this beautiful learning network just with the small group of us here today that is experiential, that is sense-based um, and that hopefully we can take something away with us. So thank you so very much. Mm -hmm.